this here is the roof of our new institute uh, building, the so-called Arctech Lab. Uh, this institute building was initiated by the institute and also a number of professors collaborated there. And we designed this roof. If you take a look at this, let's say, top view plan, uh, you, you sense it feels a bit like a, a textile, which is a bit stretched at some points, etc. And I like this drawing because it gives you a sense of what the digital can do, namely it can adapt to different situations very easily. And this is something, if you now think in professional sense, if you now think architecture, which is a huge advantage. It means that you can design something, you can define the details, you can do all the architectural design work, but you can design it in a way that it can react and change to something. Now, a lot of construction nowadays goes that you design something, once you, and when you think you have it, you do a design freeze, and then you go into execution planning. But in execution planning, all the problems start because someone says, well, this is not really working, you need to change your design, then you go back, maybe you change it, or you can't change it anymore because it would involve too, much, too many costs, so it's just going to be built how the contractor wants to build it, etc. But if you now can design something which has the ability or agility to, to be flex, uh, flexible at certain moments, and you can decide and design this openness, similar to the M table, but now in the professional realm, then you gain something. You can actually uh, kind of engineer this to the moment that it's built, and changes can be allowed in the system, and it causes no trouble at all because it's just generated or regenerated. So what you see here, actually, and I'm going to come to that later, these are the, the columns where this roof is supported. These are the, the, <coughs> the primary support beams. These are uh, some... some uh, uh, exhaust ducts which need to go through the roof, etc. But these were all much later defined in the process and shifted around, etc. The roof is constructed out of simple timber elements, so simple slats which are um, stacked, layered on top of one another in, with three bottom cord, uh, cord layer and a three upper cord layer with, connected with diagonals. And this spans over 12 meters. And then different subsystems, because this is now real architecture, come together and are integrated in the roof. And all these different subsystems, I'm not going to go into detail, have some consequences on the roof. Push away certain slats, etc. For example, the, where the roof light is, you want to have a sparse situation of the slats. You don't want to have many slats because you want the, the, the natural light go through the slats, etc. And all this kind of starts to enrich what these, how these slats behave to one another to form this design. And so through your design process, you start to enrich this computational model. This is how, let's say, a representation of that computational model looks like. This is the raw information. So just you see center lines and connection nodes, which are defined. And here you see how it builds up to a volumetric model and to the entire 3D model. So in principle, this is a fully programmed design. So here, you don't model anything on the computer. Maybe a couple of control lines, but in principle, you actually write a program which uh, brings your intention out. And because it's a program, it's flexible and can always change to the moment of its execution. And because it's a program, it can also generate the information of execution. So what you design is what you make. So there is no separation between these things. And that's quite radical in architecture because classically <clears throat> that is strongly separated and has different uh, specialists working on different problems when you go from design to fabrication. What it also means is you need to know about fabrication when you design. That's a burden on one hand side, because you need to know a lot. Uh, on the other hand side, it's a great uh, freedom to, uh, to the architect to be able to be closer to the physicality of uh, what he's doing, something which has been lost sometimes also in the profession, 
uh, when we start to just concentrate on drawing plans. So this roof now consists out of 50,000 individual slats, 168 larger beams, and they're all individual, so no slat is the same, or it would be an accident if they were the same, and we don't care if they're the same. What we care is how this roof works spatially. Uh, it kind of um, <clears throat> accentuates the spaces between the primary supports where it sits on, and on the top side, it uh, allows for the water evacuation into uh, the columns, and in between is a structurally optimized uh, double layer system. To show you a bit of the details, how this then comes together, this is, I think, a nice example. Here you see the, the nails which connect all this roof. So the slats are very simple, the nails also. But how do you solve this? So every slat, again, is different. They lay on top of one another. You need, you know at every point how much force you need to, um, to be able to carry there. This, this requires a certain number of nails. Now you need to bring in those nails, but those nails protrude to, through two levels, so you should not have hit the nails below. And what happens now if you do hit the nail? How do you correct for that? What are your rules? How do you shift those nails around? And what if you cannot fit the number of nails which you need to, to bring there? Then we developed strategies. For example, you can make a slat a bit slightly longer like this. You because you need an edge distance, you can uh, fit some other nails. You can also choose to have another slat size, slat width, etc. And like this, by optimizing this, we got a kind of, <coughs> how could I say? Um, so basically, we optimized the technical problem here to sort this out. But what we got architecturally is an algorithmic detail because uh, we can see it afterwards. I, I will point it out to you when we see the architectural images. Now this seam where all these nails come together has some behavior. It starts to, to chick sometimes, etc. It almost looks like an error sometimes or, or uh, artisanal <laughs> work. But in fact, it's the algorithm of optimization which expresses itself in that detail trying to find the minimum amount of, of nails and the minimum amount of wood to have this building stand up. And I think it's kind of interesting. Do we shift in an area where we have algorithmic details, which, which kind of are part of our physical world? From our perspective, let's be open. Let's see what it does and, and uh, if it's culturally appreciated. Here you see how this is made. So simple timber slats here brought by the robot. This is a, a saw which can take different angles. The robot selects the length and cuts them at this specific angle. Then positions these slats. If you look at this, you, you're reminded of similarities to a brick process. But you could also think of a 3D printing process almost. Okay, it's discrete parts, but it's a layering process where you basically build this up. The positioning information is for free, the length of the slats is for free, the waste is absolutely minimal. And here you see how this nailing pattern comes. You don't recognize the logic, but it's all logical where these nails are put. Um, it's operated by one human. This is quality control step. So he compares the nailing patterns and checks if, the, if nails were not uh, broken. This is automatically photographed and, and uh, kind of registered so that we have a quality control. And like this, these beams can actually be pretty autonomously produced. You again see the nailing patterns. This is one of these 100. I believe 68 elements. And then they're, they're fitted with classical craftsmanship. Uh, the only difference is that these steps of montage, etc., have already been integrated. So, for example, the knowledge whether you need to access something, etc., is all part of this digital model. And the digital model tries to always 
fit this in so that then you can relatively easily uh, mount or bring in the subsystems and connect it and mount it. The biggest surprise when mounting this was that the steel structure it was erected on was actually skewed. <laughs> so, well, it's a new topic, right? You have manual construction and steel. We were thinking this is very precise. Apparently, it wasn't so precise. And you have digital parts. How do the, the, the manual and the digital parts come together? And uh, yes, here you have some. But let's go maybe to the nicer movie of Muda because it's filmed much more artistically. <laughs> uh, so you, here you have some, some impressions uh, of this roof. It's 2,300 square meters um, big. And you get a bit of sense. Well, let's see. Here from the outside, you see how these artificial lights are integrated and the natural lights, how, how it all in, kind of integrates and overlays into one structure. Form doesn't cost anything in this paradigm of production. So while classically you have to pay for form, here form is for free. The flat roof would cost exactly the same as the curved. What does that mean to architecture? And you get a sense here of what I meant with this artistic detail. So this here, which looks a bit jacked, etc., that's, that's an optimization, but it doesn't look like an optimization because it actually gives it quite a tangible quality, thanks a lot, <coughs> uh, to the work. 